Okay, so this is uh, an introduction into uh, the marvels of plant reproduction, which is a whole lot more erotic than you would imagine. Uh, so you, you really need to know the parts of a flower and you need to be able to apply that to any of the flowering plants. So this is a pretty typical flower model. And uh, working from the outside in, the outer layer, these sort of green, leathery, leaf-like structures are called the sepals. And their job, if you like, if you can imagine a flower bud, is to cover the outside of the flower bud and protect it from the elements. When the flower opens then, the sepals kind of move apart and the petals emerge. And in an insect pollinated flower, these are often large and brightly coloured. Uh, some of them may have, because insects can see UV, which we can't, if you shine a UV light on them, they look amazing with guidelines down saying, this way, this way to the goodies. So they're all attached to the receptacle, <coughs> as are the male and female parts of the flower. So the male parts of the flower are the anthers and the filament. Filament, you can see down here, attached to the receptacle. And the, the filament is just a sort of a, a long tube holding the anthers into position. The anthers themselves are the site of gametogenesis, so this is where the pollen is going to be made. And uh, pollen is the equivalent of sperm, I suppose, so anybody with hay fever would like perhaps to think about that. Not too much. Uh, if we cut across, so when we looked at the anther down the microscope last year, and we'll do again this year, uh, you can see that it's, uh, if you look at it, sort of, when you get a slide, you're kind of looking down there, and there are four little pollen sacs, and so obviously they have the sort of length of the anther, and how long that may be. And the pollen sacs are where the sort of main business of gametogenesis takes place. The filament, coming up through here, is um, carrying oxygen and glucose and all the nutrients that they need. If you look down at the bottom of the flower then, this, all this sort of big green bit down here is the female parts of the flower. So at the top we've got the stigma, it's sticky uh, to encourage the attachment of pollen grains. It's got a sort of sugary solution. When we do pollination, in the pollination video, you'll see that the sugary solution is to help the pollen grains to germinate. We've got this long tube style, uh, which the pollen is going to have to, you know, it's going to have to get from up here all the way down to here to fertilise it. So the style is that sort of tube that connects it. And this sort of expanded area down here is an uh, ovary. Now, in quite a lot of plants, there are many ovules inside the ovary. And the ovule is this bit round here. It includes uh, integuments, and inside of that, we've got the embryo sac, which is where the female gametes are. So you can see that you know, pollination is just transferring the gametes to up here, but the male gametes are going to have to, a bit like sperm, sort of digest their way through, all the way through to do the fertilization of this embryo sac. So the embryo sac, part of the ovule and that's the bit that's going to turn into a seed. Have I forgotten anything? Okay, very good, excellent. So, moving on then, you also need to be aware of wind, whoa, wind pollinated, oops, wind pollinated flowers. So here, we've got an insect pollinated uh, flower, and you can see it's got all the same bits. It's got the receptacles, sepals, petals, the ovary, the ovule, the embryo sac, filament, anther. The whole of an insect pollinated flower is designed to, at the bottom very often they've got nectaries, and it's to, that's a kind of a reward for their pollinators, so the, the petals guide the pollinators into the flower so that they actually enter into the flower and can pick up the pollen grains, have a drink of nectar, and then hopefully go to another flower of the same species and deposit the pollen onto the stigma of that species. So these are sort of, you know, brightly coloured, very conspicuous, very visible. 
Wind-pollinated flowers, of course, have no obligation whatsoever to do anything to attract an insect, but what they need to do is to catch pollen from the wind and they need to disperse their pollen into the wind. So a wind-pollinated flower typically has very long, delicate, feathery uh, anthers that stick outside of, the, so the anthers are sort of very mobile. When they split open, they just chock a block with lots of very small pollen, which is why your wind pollinators are very often associated with hay fever, because they're just dispersing it into the wind. So they're hanging outside of the flower, so I just like to think of wind pollinators. They let it all hang out in the breeze. So the, the stigmas, obviously, they, it's no use having them inside the flower because the wind's blowing past the flower, so they are long and they're often very feathery and they will then pick up, uh, have more chance of picking up pollen grains out of the air as they blow past. So this is a grass flower very inconspicuous sort of little green petals you don't need to know any of these strange terms like glooms and lemmas and all the rest of it you need to remember that the stigmas and the anthers are outside of the flower to catch the wind and then they've got the usual things you know they've still got styles and ovaries and all the rest of it in your practical book <coughs> i'm just going to replace this with a practical book you have got the example of a wind-pollinated plantain uh, flower. So uh, plantains uh, grow quite close to the ground. Um, so the leaves kind of spread across the ground. Uh, the two main types in Britain is um, the, the one with very broad leaves and the one, the lanceolate one, with very more grass-like leaves. But the flowers sort of shoot up out of that plant so that they're standing up in the wind. And in your practical book you can see here some ripe anthers hanging out in the breeze. These are the ones that have been pollinated, so these the anthers have died off down at the bottom. And at the top we've got these sort of little feathery stigma sticking out at the top to do the uh, to catch the pollen as it drifts past. So if you're looking at characteristics of insect pollinated flowers, they don't have any of these sort of mechanisms. They're not producing nectar, they're not highly scented, they're not brightly coloured, but they do need to be out there in the wind. So it's sort of interpret, you know, sort of just thinking about AO2, AO3, if you were given um, any plant, catkin, something that you've not seen before, you need to think, is it sort of hanging out in the wind or is it trying to attract an insect? Um, there are all sorts of odd things like wind pollinated flowers. I know in meadows these are flowering sort of all the time, but because they're able to grow up tall. But trees are very often wind pollinated and tree flowers therefore usually emerge way before the leaves do. And that's just that there's no impediment to the wind catching the pollen and taking it away and no impediment to the pollen landing on the stigmas. So that might be something, that's something that's cropped up in exam questions before. So if the flowers are emerging before the leaves, potentially wind pollinated. That's all I know. <laughs>